This is Musings of the Shy podcast. I'm your host, Rosia Shy. Hello, and welcome to my continuation of my Silk Road podcast. I'm about to Silk Road my place. And on this episode, we're going to talk about vulnerability, which is very important. <clears throat> Often discussed, so many things in this world is an important topic when it comes to cryptocurrency. interesting industry. There's a lot of stuff that's been going on um, in the world of art recently. So I just found this very interesting because it's kind of very bizarre and very out of the realm of James Bond and Christopher Burton. Something that you can see in movies is not necessarily in the actual application of the world. So the older brother of the current world leader is present in the world. His brother Philip, who we all know, was killed by a VX drug agent in Poison. Uh, the Poison used to kill uh, Kim Yong Nam, the half brother of the older Kim Yong, was a VX drug agent, which is just a chemical weapon. Uh, the lady, uh, mm. government members are also back in Poison. I just found it just overall very fascinating considering that um, currently we have a PR, or I should say the US government. Ships in Korea, which has ships off the story because it's it's like everybody everybody just kind of wants to go want to go work free and just like count down on somewhere all the pieces of looting. It's like uh, have you ever seen this? Uh, mostly football players, but not too much. You know, just for the NFL and football, where you see a player psyching themselves up and they're like, "Ah, oh, it's like kind of like how I ran." It seems like all these people say all these possible pieces that can fall over to the front of their chest and they're being psyched up and ready to go to war. Uh, Arizona gives legal status to blockchain-based smart contracts. The Ethereum technology is executed in a sealed pool by the state of Arizona, which passed a bill giving legal status to smart contracts and blockchain-based signatures, considering them as an ordinary contract that can be received in real states. Uh, this comes from Trust Nodes. Business safety bonus. Uh, this was passed uh, in the beginning of April. A signature is secured through the blockchain technology is considered to be an electronic form of the electronic signature. A record or contract that is secured through the blockchain technology is considered to be a an electronic form of the electronic record. Smart contracts, they exist in commerce. A contract related to a transaction does not need to bind to the effect of validity or enforceability solely because that contract contains a smart contract. Contract term. In effect, the new legislation applies current contract laws to blockchain based contracts. Erasing any uncertainty in the event clear that any blockchain based agreement is fully enforceable in a court of law. The law goes further to say that the blockchain based data amounts to ownership of important, important current property rights to the nascent field of the agreement legal ambiguity as to what may amount to theft in this case. So, this is very important. I mean, this is, this is, this is the state legislative level. It could be indicated that Arizona is seeking Based, uh, Ethereum based or smart contract based companies to come to their state and um, you know, clean their shingle there. Uh, this is something that Andrew Ledger and I, um, you know, we said, like, like Kim Foundation, we were um, discussing in the first episode of the first season of 
Mr. Robot and her um, dad debacle was occurring, was occurring, we were discussing whether or not a smart contract is actually a legal contract. Is it something that's enforceable by law? Well, maybe socially enforceable, but is it legally enforceable? Could you go to the court to get um, made whole, if you will, the contract if you will, so I encourage you to check that out. It's not really on the exercise of the podcast. But it's just another step forward. It's actually one of the more positive legislative actions I have seen when it comes to um, cryptocurrency and making stuff on uh, cryptocurrency products, making it more and more legal and out of the gray area when it comes to the marketplaces. Uh, Twitter says White House backs down in a fight over anti-Trump. Uh, this comes from CBS News. Uh, the Trump administration has backed down from a request to Twitter to identify users behind an account critical of the president and American Civil Liberties Union embraced Friday. Twitter said it was notified by the Justice Department that the Department of Homeland Security has withdrawn its demands for information about the account in question at uh, ALT underscore uh, USCIS, CBS News, just to quarter Paula Reed reports. The ALC, the ACLU called it the shift to big victory for free speech and the right to dissent. Uh, the Twitter had defied the U.S. government uh, request for records that could identify the user behind an account proposed to President, President Donald Trump uh, taking steps to challenge that order in court. The company filed a lawsuit Thursday in San Francisco Federal Court against the Federal Department of Homeland Security and its Customs and Border Protection Office, charging that an effort to unmask the people behind the account violated the First Amendment. Twitter said his users have the constitutional right to dissent in such anonymous and pseudonym political speech. Twitter declined to comment beyond the lawsuit on Thursday, and DHS likewise declined to comment. So, the reason I bring this up is because, um, as we're talking about the aftermath of So Below, we're talking about discussing the decentralized marketplaces, um, we just keep going on, and I'm adding pieces here to this overall overview. Um, encryption is important in the encryption. We talked about about the app market and how it gives a kind of a well, gives security as a communication, a false sense of security when it comes to selling goods and services through the marketplace because they're so centralized. It's all about centralized services. The reason why the Department of or the Justice Department was able to issue a subpoena is because Twitter holds all that information in a centralized server. It was individually held or spread out like you know, in the uh, OB1 or any other set of places. Decentralized marketplaces, you won't be issued with this problem like that, then it wouldn't be as easy to be able to discuss and send that information without the ear of advisor about it, be it in a professional nature, financial nature, or in an actual government uh, sphere. I think that's something we will talk about when we talk about uh, the attempt to decentralize Twitter, which is a which I like to call the, the you know the town prior the most uh, accessible uh, easy means of broad broadcasting information publicly. Um, we'll talk about things like Mastodon and other efforts to do the same activity, but in a uh, some of it in a decentralized nature. Uh, some of it um, we'll we'll get into that when we talk about. Our And finally, Bitcoin developers meet in Berlin and discuss wallet standardizations. This comes from Crypto Insider by Justin Thornell. So there's been a lot of like meetups uh, that have been occurring throughout the space where the various companies come and meet and discuss either standardizing the uh, certain aspects of the cryptocurrency space, uh, coming to some, some kind of agreement. Uh, one of the biggest things that is Talk about it when we to discuss the blockchain debate uh, raising the uh, block size, size in Bitcoin is about the Chinese miners and the Chinese community coming up with their concerning um, block sizes and concerning the standardization. And we'll talk about it and discuss it in another episode. But this seems to be more 
open meeting. Not all these meetings have been very transparent and for a lot of you. A lot of them might be open ones who are very concerned, very concerned that their effort to centralize is decentralized platform. But anyways, there may be a need for standardization and for these companies to get together, it's it's perfectly fine. Um, as long as anything that occurs is just open for anyone to see and if someone doesn't want to do what is agreed upon the standard, if you will, then that's acceptable as well. Um, a group of Bitcoin wallet developers and companies, some of whom refer to themselves as the Bitcoin wallet standards group, met to discuss the future of Bitcoin wallet standardization this past Friday in Berlin. Some, some of the biggest names in the space will be is over to S3ND. The meeting called uh, S3ND pronounced SIN to represent how Bitcoin handles push payments, including some well known Bitcoin wallet and service providers in the cryptocurrency space. Amory, uh, Bitcoin J, Cypher, CypherX, um, Konami, Google Bitbox, Electrum, Green Andros, Easy Ledger, Lightning Labs, Mycelium, and Trezor will all represent the room in the meeting today. We'll see. Um, Try to Armory, uh, Electrum, have it on my list. Uh, green addresses, uh, mycelium, a fan of mycelium on the Androids. Um, Treasure and Ledger, I haven't actually gotten into the hard wallets per se yet. I'm looking to do open dive first and then uh, go up. Uh, many current Bitcoin developers refer to collectively as the Bitcoin Core, who also run their own wallet software, hardware, or services for attendees. This discussion about the need for Bitcoin wallet standards and the interoperability has been emerged during the 2016 Scaling Bitcoin event in Milan. According to the same conference organizer, Akon, having a safer and positive end user experience is incredibly important to Bitcoin's success as it ensures that the wallets themselves are both interoperable and robust. Mr. Young industry wide co crypto insider and head of the meeting. Over the last few years, the Bitcoin ecosystem has been maturing to a sense that efforts should be made to foster coordination between interested Bitcoin wallet developers so that they can meet to discuss the ways in which they can interoperate with one another and discuss the best security practices, take a look at the upcoming technologies, and answer each other's questions. So that has occurred. Let's see, April 7th, today's event is occurring over the weekend, so we'll see what the discussion is on like Monday and Tuesday, and uh, we'll maybe follow up on that. So interesting bits of block on, uh, blockchain, we're going to have this segment in a little bit. How the Block Notary app and EELA work with the Vermont Blockchain Block. So here's another um, state is addressing the unique form of technology. Uh, this comes from Decentralized Today. It was written by Block Notary itself. So it's a kind of a uh, I'll get to the word later. Um, how the Block Notary app and ELA work with the Vermont Blockchain Block. Verification and authentication are two of the benefits you get with a block notary, notary interview. Because it's a blockchain enable, and now that the governments are recognizing the blockchain, block notary and its technology can help in legal situations a law in Vermont. A recent legal review of block notary and users' devices fee agreement by Gravel and Shea of Burlington, Vermont, USA was how the software concise with the state of Vermont's H868. Act 157, an act relating to the miscellaneous economic development provision, which includes a section on blockchain technology and uses for authenticity of records. The law went into effect on July 1st, 2016. The new law takes advantage of the blockchain ability to confirm that information transferred to, its, to it is authentic. In the legal system in the U.S. and other countries, a document or record must not first be found, first be authentic before it's introduced into a legal proceeding. According to the rules of evidence. In other words, a party that wants to introduce a record as evidence must first demonstrate the record is what it appears to be. Which is very important because when it comes to legal documents, particularly digital documents, is a bit of concern because it's so easy to obfuscate and 
falsified uh, digital documents, so the ability to put that on the, the blockchain support, uh, just in general to be able to change records or alter records, even with physical records. Uh, there's all sorts of series of legal cases and even um, significant issues when it comes to property records where all of a sudden they either disappear, there's a fire, uh, they've been altered to basically either take or obfuscate people's um, ownership of property. So this is important. Uh, the similar technology like this uh, is being utilized to uh, authenticate, authenticate uh, goods, like for example, artwork. Um, artwork is one something of very high value, um, the ability to transfer wealth, if you will, uh, like something like a Picasso, go for like a minimum of a million dollars to you know, something as much as you know, 50, 100, 100, 200 million dollars for a painting. The ability to verify and authenticate that it is a Picasso, the person actually owns it, the person who owned it before that was the owner, and so it's kind of like a, almost like a chain of custody, adds to, can actually add to the value of the artwork, or more importantly, just demonstrate that it is a piece, that it, it was known to be in custody, somebody, you know, either through uh, other publication or other secondary information that so many witnesses have indicated that this person owned this particular artwork in um, 1986, so that person was the owner and then they transferred to this other person maybe 10 years later. It kind of, again, it just demonstrates that, okay, we can know there was some one hand in one custody for a period of time to another person's custody. Uh, that's important. And when I say when it can add value, like, for example, if someone is a certain person of note to have owned a Picasso, it kind of just adds to it, kind of adds a, um, adds a sheet to it. Um, which can be very important, and even a person that is, um, you know, a fellow artist be given a piece by an artist at the time, like they were peers, can add weight, especially if that um, artwork typically when a peer transferred a piece, a piece of artwork to another peer, um, either in reference to that person or reference to a mutual person, or there's some added personal story attached to it. So that so that is important. Be able to authenticate it. You know, it is that that painting and made of those paints and all those type of canvas and stuff like that is also important. It's going to be demonstrated for other forms of commerce to be able to demonstrate that you're receiving the actual goods that, that you paid for. And to apply this to um, legal documentation, it can allow for um, more transparency because you can see it through the blockchain, you can't alter the record. Um, it will allow for um, I think really transparency, once transparency is put in place in a lot of these different sectors, a lot of the things that people have been seeing, mm-hmm. like the type of reforms or things we've been asking for in these type of sectors, are going to ripple out. But before we get there, we have to work on the whole aspect of transparency and people understanding how this is going to make things transparent and we can see everything, know everything, but then we can come up with a moment in time, whether you travel back in time to of something that occurred at a certain date, uh, it is possible for you to do that with great certain amount of validity and um, basically just kind of go from there. So kind of finishing up the article, uh, the new Vermont law presumes that documents right into the blockchain are authentic as long as verification can be obtained as the date and time of recording the information in the blockchain. And such information is entered in a regular practice. The information qualifies as self-authenticity Authenticating record and regularly maintaining business records for the purpose of any legal proceeding in Vermont court. As a result, information in accordance with blockchain can be presumed to be accurate for the purpose such as the determining uh, contractual parties, contractual provisions in the execution of documents, B, determining the ownership, assignment, negotiation, and the transfer of money. Importantly, the presumption doesn't apply to the contents of the record itself. All documents written to the blockchain could be introduced as evidence for the requirements. The contents of the document could be challenged as inaccurate by parties in a legal proceeding. So if someone put, like, either by error or try to falsify the information saying that I own this red Ferrari, blah, 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 just because it's in the blockchain doesn't mean that you own the red Ferrari, Ferrari you can um, still challenge that in a legal proceeding. In proceeding, all it's, all it's going to do is that at some point in time, at a date and time, you 
enter this information that you own this red Ferrari. And now it's being challenged whether that's authentic or not. Um, then it talks about other states that might be on board. It's interesting that Hawaii is on here, but it's Vermont, Hawaii, Illinois, and we already talked about Arizona. Um, more states are currently exploring the use of blockchain technology in 2017. Illinois has proposed setting up a task force to look at how to use the technology for record keeping. Hawaii is an initiative to create a work group to study blockchain and virtual currencies due to the popular currency in the industry. And Arizona's already passed a legislative law on smart contracts. It's quite possible that if the right law succeeds, it will spread to other states. So that is kind of a bit more blockchain. Now on to the rest of the episode about fungibility. So what is fungibility? What does it mean? And what does it have to do with the same terms as so? Let's just define the term fungibility. Fungibility is the property of a good or commodity whose individual uses are changeable in digital substitution, i.e., interchangeability. So, for example, the fact that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are divisible, um, do Bitcoin and Bitcoin have to be in the Bitcoin is divisible up to uh, the eighth decimal point, which is 100 million, and is considered in- infinitely, 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 oh. It's considered you can do. Divide it as many times as you want. All you have to do is get consensus from um, the block network, if you will, from everyone within the, the Bitcoin network to agree to move the decimal point either one, two, or three spaces. Uh, it's not foreseen that being any particular type of issue or need, but it's something that you can do is programmable within the uh, Bitcoin program that you can move the decimal point. It's not a hard lock at um a division up to eight decimal points and basically if you think of it in this sense when it comes to bitcoin any piece of it can be interchanged like if you have a half a btc and you want to change it out for um, your friends half a btc if you just got want you guys want to play a game of just sitting back and forth back and forth back and forth um this ha- uh two different halves of btc and see who will uh not send it back you know, you send it first to your friend, then he's supposed to send his to you and see whether or not he actually sends it or he keeps yours. Uh, just kind of a nice little thought experiment, if you will. Um, well, they're interchang- interchangeable. They're also interchangeable spending. Like, for example, if you were to spend half a BTC at a store and receive some goods and then you turn around and um, that business were to take that um BTC and sell it in an exchange, um, it will get purchased. Uh, it's it's just basically the fact that you can switch things out. It's mutually um, interchangeable. You, you know, one five is the same as another five when it comes to dollar bills. So you switch out whether it's, you know, some people get like, oh, it's a little dirty or whatever. It doesn't matter if it's clean or dirty or just tiny rip. As long as you can read those serial numbers, you, you can spend that $5. Uh, same thing with BTC. As long as you... Uh, send the private and public key out to another person and they can get, and they in turn can send it out to the private and public key. They can go on and on and on. It, it really doesn't matter. that They're all, everything's pretty much equal. Um, and we'll get into where, where the issue is of whether they're not being equal. Uh, but to finish out the term, uh, this is a property of essence of goods which are capable of being substituted in place of one another. For example, since one ounce of pure gold is equivalent to any other ounce of, of pure gold, whether it's coins, ignorance, or forms, gold is fungible. Other fungible con- commodities include sweet crude oil, company shares, bonds, and other precious metals and currencies. Fungibility refers only to the equivalency of each unit of a commodity with other units of the same commodity. Fungibility does not relate to the exchange of one commodity for another different commodity. So, where are the issue it comes with fungibility with Bitcoin? comes to the fact that because of places like the Silk Road Marketplace, that being the first but not the only one, where people would purchase illicit goods with Bitcoin, that Bitcoin is considered tainted because it's used in a transaction for illegal goods. And because of the blockchain, you can see where all the public transactions occur and you can trace that um, if you determine... um, what Silk Road, and we know what Silk Road's marketplace's uh, public addresses are, then you know that that, it w- that it's um, utilized um, for the purpose of purchasing drugs. That, is, that public address is, has been tagged 
than any Bitcoins uh, sent to it uh, was used to purchase for illegal goods. And so any Bitcoin that comes out of that public, public address and when you follow it through the blockchain, then you know that it's tainted. It's no longer good. Um, even if you were, even if you move it from a different address, it can be followed through. And when you begin to sell it onto exchange, and then someone were to purchase that uh, that same very same set of bitcoins, whether it be one or ten or ten thousand, and either a block of them or small segments of them, a piece of that block that bitcoin, whether you divide it up into 0 0.25, 0 0.5, or down to the satoshi. Um, it's tainted. It's traceable to a bad transaction or what people perceive to be a bad transaction, which is a drug purchase or illicit purchase. And this is where the issue of fungibility is coming into because there are exchanges and nodes that are blacklisting certain types of transaction transactions from trying to get into the blockchain from being sold on their exchanges. And this is where the issue of fungibility comes in to where if because of public transactions, because everything's broadcast on the public blockchain, and if you're able to tag a particular blockchain and know it to be used for a certain type of transaction, then that, that Bitcoin is, is not fungible. It's not the same. It's not an equal to value. And so when you go to sell it or use it, either people are not going to accept that Bitcoin or even pieces of that Bitcoin or you are going to have to sell it at a lower value than what is the actual value of other Bitcoins are. So let's get into the nature of it. Um, okay, so Bitcoin um, violates the principle of fungibility. This is um, by Travis uh, Patton on Cointelegraph. So this is uh, all the way back of... Uh, April of 2015, so two years ago. Actually, this date, two years ago. In light of recent events with the Bitcoin industry, namely the evolution marketplace, is going up in a burst of flames with customers' money, it's become clear that cryptocurrency deviates from traditional money in more ways than initially meets the eye. Bitcoin, among the slate of other cryptocurrencies, violates the principles of fungibility with money. That is, each coin, coin's transaction history differentiates them from each other Bitcoin in circulation. With the collapse of the hidden evolution marketplace, these coins have now been tainted, and services are willfully denied their deposits as well as held by exchange businesses. Bitcoin fungibility has been called into question and has become a glaringly obvious that it poses a threat to the stability and long-term usage of such currencies. Exchanges want nothing to do with stolen funds and therefore lessens their value in relation to other identical currency units. Cryptocurrencies, okay, and then it talks about Dash or probably Dark Coin. Uh, come on the scene with the promise of anonymizing transactions by designs, which is not implemented in the core of Bitcoin. Um, so there's that issue because of um, the fact that uh, some funds are stolen, then you can't spend it. Like if someone were to rob a convenience store or a bank, banks is a little tricky because uh, banks are in sometimes um, the type of cash as a part of a security measure is traceable, um, there's just die packs, there's micro tags, things of that nature. But for example, just a convenience store. You go in, you rob a convenience store, you take the cash out, you get away with the crime, and then you want to go spend it. You go and you buy like shoes or jewelry or whatever. However you want to spend it. The jewelry store is not going to question your cash. They're just going to take it. They assume it's your cash. Pure and simple. Uh, it's only when, it, for example, you get caught and it comes back and then 